Hi all. Um, I was just thinking about interpreting um, the Art of War. I found a wiki book. I think this is outside of copyright for the author. And uh, let's examine this um, wiki book. Uh, so the Art of War. I've just been inspired actually by a Peter Sellers film called Being There, where this gardener is uh, taken as like anything he's saying has been taken as profound wisdom. Uh, and I was reminded, you know, I, I thought that a lot of Nimzovich stuff uh, was actually related to um, the art of war uh, in some way. Um, so I don't know if any of you guys are interested in helping me try and interpret uh, this interpretation of the art and war or art of war this is translated from the Chinese um, by Lionel Giles 1910 um, so would any of you be interested in, in just checking out the implications for chess just briefly um, well I don't know how briefly but um, the the these the sections like there's 13 sections here so laying plans waging war the art of attack by stratagem tactical disposition so this is like strategy and tactics here energy weak points and strong I mean Nimzovich had talked about weak points and strong maneuvering is of course another thing we get from Steinitz especially in closed positions the importance of maneuvering uh, variations in tactics that's very interesting the army on the march I don't know if that means like um, slow kind of maneuvering on the march terrain you know there's different terrain can we can be looked at in chess um, the different types of center I think if you have like an open center it really affects the game it makes it a lot more tactical if you have a closed position then there's a lot more maneuvering so the type of terrain affects the art of war so the nine situations attack by fire maybe that's slightly irrelevant to chess and the use of spies I'm not really sure about that one but um so is anyone there willing to uh, try and take an interpretational look about this, or should I just should I just try and uh, do it? Um, and maybe you can comment. Anyone, anyone there? Um, so interpreting the art of war in chess terms. Anyone keen? Oh, this is a bit Saturday. It's a bit of a strange thing to do on Saturday. I know. But um, yeah, I, I've been sort of just inspired. I've got this moment of inspiration, crazy inspiration from watching this Peter Sellers film called Being There. So so basically in the Peter Sellers film, um, the things he said about the garden, like the seasons and strong roots, were interpreted in a completely different context about economic policy. But on the other hand, you can argue that gardening is a, is a powerful metaphor uh, for economic policy. So I thought, hold on a sec. What about chess? And I did sort of mention actually to Chess Cube um, in the recent competition about the name of a tournament. And I said the art of war, actually. And that was one of the chosen uh, things for, for some Chess Cube tournaments, the art of war. Because um, I've always thought, actually, um, it's, it's an ancient uh, Chinese manuscript about how best uh, you use your resources in the light of a competitive situation. And that's a bit abstract. Uh, but you know Nimzovich was often a bit abstract and in chess if you don't just want to be an if-then calculator then I think having abstract ideas really helps uh, an abstract foundation I think is the cornerstone of a player that not just wins but wins games with ease without too much heavy calculation if you have these fundamental concepts uh, behind you uh, so here you know we, we've got a kind of um, you know abstract view here of the art of war so let's see uh, chapter one laying plans and to see the relevance so we click on laying plans uh, so Sun Tzu said the art of war is of vital importance to the state okay in chess it's just um, w winning with white or black <laughs> okay it's a matter of life or, life or death a road either to safety or ruin Hence, it's a subject of inquiry which can on no account be neglected. Okay. The art of war is governed by five constant factors to be taken into account uh, in one's deliberations when seeking to determine the conditions obtaining in the field. 
So we've got the moral law, heaven, earth, the command of method and discipline. Um, at the moment, this seems super, super abstract. It's not really that relevant for chess. Um, so if we look into the moral law, so it causes the people um, to be in const complete accord with their ruler. So they'll follow him regardless of, of, of their lives, dismayed by any anger. Well, in chess, um, well, the pieces are, are following um, to try and win the game, and they can sacrifice themselves. Heaven signifies uh, night and day, cold and heat, times and seasons. Actually, in the Pizza Sellers film, you know, the seasons was mentioned, so don't expect growth in the winter season. You know, expect it in, in, in you know, the spring and summer. So the seasons actually dictate almost like expectation. Um, so, may, you know, maybe all of these have an influence on, on expectation in some way. Um, so the earth comprises distances, great and small, danger and security, open ground and narrow passes, the chances of life and death. Not really sure how this could relate to chess. Um, maybe speak up if you've got any ideas. Um, okay, I think it's just too abstract at the moment. Maybe the commander stands for the virtues of wisdom, sincerity, benevolence, courage and strictness. Well, I guess when you play chess, you do have to be um, strict with yourself have have confidence have benevolence have have all these you you as the chess player are the commander maybe so you need to be wise sincere benevolent courage and strict uh with yourself so maybe the commander is us as the player and the moral law is just our chess pieces that they have to follow uh method and discipline <clears throat> okay uh so method and discipline understood as the marshalling of the army in its proper subdivisions the graduations of rank among the officers, the maintenance of roads by which supplies may reach the army, and the control of military expenditure. Well, I guess in chess we do have um, a ranking system for the pieces. That we consider the pawns to be the lowest rank, but on the other hand they can promote to queens and they can be very useful. But we do have a graduation of rank among the officers. We have the knights and bishops are less higher ranked than, say, the rooks. And the highest rank is actually the queen because uh, it can go so quickly in so many different directions. Uh, so the maintenance of roads by which supplies may reach the army and the control of military expenditure. Okay, so I think um, we're talking about the chess player as the commander and the method and discipline, um, sort of being aware of the ranking of the army and stuff. So, I don't know. Um, okay. I'm wondering, um, this, this is really just super abstract stuff. So, um, I think I'm going to just save each chapter on my soon, just in case it gets lost, and this is indeed of any interest uh, later. So, okay, let, let's, let's continue here. So these five heads should be familiar to every general. He who knows them will be victorious. He, will, he who knows them not will fail. Okay. Therefore, in your deliberations, when seeking to determine the military conditions, let them be made on the basis of comparison. <clears throat> oh, sorry, Brian. I've, I've just been inspired by this film uh, called Being There by Peter Sellers. Eight, eight out of ten actually on IMDb uh, where this gardener his 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 uh, interpretations of gardening are taken as um, analogous to economic policy so for example to expect seasons in the garden like in the winter you're not going to have much growth and they were all taking Peter Sellers to be talking very profoundly about economic policy and and towards the end of the film he's like become a candidate for being president and it just reminded me, actually, of the art of war, because I actually always felt that Nimzovich may have nicked some of his ideas from the art of war. Um, well, most evident, if you look on the structure, if we just, we'll get back to point 12, but if you look at this structure, you'll see weak points and strong is, is in Nimzovich, you see. Weak points and strong, manoeuvring, Steinitz, uh, 
and terrain could be like the center you know how different types of center can affect the whole uh, play because in an open game you'd be more tactical than a closed game um, these seem irrelevant to chess but some of these seem very interesting um, but I'll save after each section so just just laying plans actually we're just checking laying plans at the moment um, so basically um, Okay, so the general that hearkens to my council acts on it will conquer. Let such a one be re retained in command. The general that hearkens to my council nor acts on it will suffer defeat. Okay, let one be dismissed. Um, okay, sorry. So he's take. So basically, we we start off with with these uh, kind of five constant factors uh, that were established. So they're talked about here. And then these five heads should be familiar to every general. And so basically the assertion is that if you know these five things, you'll be victorious and you you fell. And in your deliberations, um, so we have these deliberations as well of, of comparison. So which of the two s sovereigns, should we call the sovereigns white or black, be imbued with the moral uh, law? Which of the two generals has the most ability? Um, with whom lies the advantages derived from heaven and earth? I don't really know. That's beyond me. Heaven and earth, night and day, cold and heat, times and seasons, earth, distances great and small, dangerous security, open ground and narrow paths, chances of life and death. It's it's super abstract. And <clears throat> I think people have interpreted the art of war for, for businesses as well. They've done business versions to try and use these things because it's basically how you you best use your resources in in different contexts really. Um, but so I'm trying trying to sort of see uh, if we can decipher this. With whom lies the advantage? Right? On which side is discipline most rigorously rigorously enforced? Uh, which army is stronger? On which side are the officers and men more highly trained? Um, in which army is there great constancy, both in reward and punishment? Um, I don't know about you guys. I find that difficult to interpret in chess terms. Um, I was hoping passwords would be here. I don't know. Is passwords here? Because I think he's very keen on um, these things. Uh, and helped earlier. I'm not sure. I'll just see if he's around on chess cube. One second. Uh, okay. Let, let's just go back and, and, and try our best here. Um, whoops. Okay. Um okay uh so <clears throat> always thought heaven and earth references was mo the mind and body okay Bri brian writes um brian writes you you can train yourself to know how to use them um so technically you can't train uh knights rooks and bishops so i guess in, in chess terms you take um the discipline of your army at uh, this point uh, to be for granted that your knight's always going to be acting as a knight um, except if they're pinned or something then they can't really act as the full piece can they uh, or the bishop's pinned but gen generally they have discipline <laughs> the pieces generally have discipline they don't like okay so um Let's see, when heeding the prophet and the council and, and yourself also of any helpful circumstances over and beyond the ordinary rules, according to circumstances favour, one should modify one's plans. According as circumstances are favourable, one should modify one's plans. I, I guess in chess you modify your plans depending on the position. Uh, so you have to modify your plans. That is a kind of chess chessy thing to be more adaptable don't just stick with your plans that because the position might have changed could, could we could we say that's 
simply does does equate well to chess this particular point 16 um, all warfare is based on deception and actually I raised this earlier in the cafe actually before starting this live stream that in chess you, you might want to veil your threats not have them too direct and blatant if you have a threat that's easily parried you might end up being in a worse position after it's been parried there's also in chess the idea of maintaining the tension so you're you're creating the, the concern of, of a lot of threats um, so this this gets very very interesting actually here for chess terms because these are hard hitting all warfare is based on deception do we really think of that in chess I, sp I guess as we get more refined as a player we stop going for the fool's mate which is an obvious fact you know bishop c4 queen f3 so we put that away and we we start to play more and more refined you know complex opening systems so in a way are we kind of making our threats more and more subtle then we're indulging in in positional play just to win squares so you start as a beginner you know trying to just make the opponent then you're thinking about material then later you might be thinking about winning squares and it all becomes more and more subtle and in a way so the threats are becoming more and more deep um so maybe you know this this statement you know relates to that that you become more and more um refined sophisticated would be the word w would you guys agree with that um so when able to attack we must seem unable when using our forces we must seem un inactive often uh, you know in certain opening systems um you know sometimes the opponent can have a seemingly um um passive position or or they use provocation <clears throat> Brian, you demonstrate this quite often in your games, uh, especially when you trade off knights for bishops to, or, or take out the opponent's advantage. You use your control of a certain uh, square or color squares. Yeah, I, I think, you know, well, the Alakine defense is provocative. Uh, we must make the enemy believe we are far away. When far away, we must <laughs> make them believe we are near. I think this all stems from this idea all warfare is based on deception. Well, I think in the King's Engine, there's a kind of deception that you're inviting uh, your opponent to you know take control of the center thinking that it will be strong but actually it's deceptive because the center can later be undermined so there's there's certainly opening systems which are based on this idea the hypermoderns yes uh Joan pib uh mentions the hypermoderns so in a way that is based on deception because there was an illusion created in the evolution of of like chess style that you had to occupy the center and so that idea uh, became a basis for deception later with the hypermoderns saying, well, you occupy the center and we'll, we'll blow it up later. So it's kind of deceptive there in a way that the hypermodern theory uh, sort of uh, inverting this idea that you don't actually need to occupy the center. It's more about controlling it and not immediately, but controlling it later. So m maybe this is echoing in chess quite strongly. Um, so when... Uh, able to attack we must seem unable so because otherwise your opponents will will parry uh your threats quite easily but if if they didn't see the threat coming uh so maybe that's a combinational blow as well because in a combinational blow where you say sacrifice a piece the opponent might not have seen that coming um but sometimes you don't want to set those combinational blows as as traps which might compromise your position. I, I think I'd qualify that. As long as the traps you set don't compromise your position, then it's good this concealing of, of attack uh, is, is useful often if they don't see a combinational blow coming. Uh, but I wouldn't like play for traps uh, myself um, unless it was a war zone and you had to win very quickly, <laughs> you know, the game. Um, hold out bait to entice the enemy. Well, in chess, we do have decoys and deflections, so we offer material to entice, uh, you know, pieces to certain squares. Feign disorder and crush him. Feign disorder and crush him. I think disorder, we'd like to have harmony in our own pieces and disharmony or disorder in the opponent's pieces. So maybe, you know, distracting pieces to, to away from their king's safety or, or just breaking harmony or encouraging spectator pieces we're feigning disorder in the opponent's position 
Um, Brian V, two, two bad hypermodern theories are well known. Can't call them the sections unless the player doesn't know. Yeah, we all know that the Alakine defense, that you know, when you move the pawns, you are creating weaknesses now. We all know that's, that's very difficult uh, to kind of um, hide. Um, and there's established, like, you know, theory uh, for, for establishing a small solid advantage. You don't need to go in, you know, for the four pawns thing. So, okay. If he is secure in all points, maybe this is saying if the opponent has a solid position, be prepared for him. Maybe that's kind of saying, look, if the opponent's got a solid position, uh, still be prepared for it, maybe to create weakness, maybe encourage weaknesses. If he is superior in strength, evade him. I think we sometimes want to play where we're stronger on certain parts of the board and where the opponent's got the advantage. So say in the King's Engine and you're playing black and the opponent's traditionally got the queen side, you don't want to really want to play there. You want to play where you're stronger on the king's side. So Victor writes, um, the Fidador lion isn't next board, but it's seemingly kind of passive, but acts um, a bit like a French. I, I think you're right, and I lost to that in, in the season, because if you're not careful, you underestimate it. And black does lovely manoeuvring to get dark squares, like a manoeuvre a knight to d4, like, you know, knight f8 to e6 to d4, and it seems passive, but, you know, black plays like move like rook e8, bishop f8, and then all of a sudden black's threatening e d4, and the pressure on the e pawn, then you've got the knight maneuvers coming in. Then you've got the c5 square. You've got to be very careful not to play a move like d takes e because you're giving black the c5 square. And in the French, similarly, uh, Brian writes, um, Brian V writes, uh, definitely in the French defense, white has a much wider range of mobility. Uh, you would consider locking up the position and rerouting resources on the queen side. Yeah, I, I think, uh, and you might even try casting on the queen side because you don't want to castle where the opponent's strong on the king side, do you? You, you know you'll get mated. Um, so if he is secure at all points, be prepared for him. If he's um, in superior strength, evade him. So that's what we do in chess. You try and evade where your opponent's like stronger, don't you? Naturally. Now, I think this is a bit Lascarian, this is point 21. If your opponent has a chronic temper, seek to irritate him. Uh, that's what Lasker would do. I think he, he would like play on his opponent's psychology and if, you know, make them over optimistic uh, in certain positions, which they think, um, you know, they, they know, but there's a slight difference and then and then they overestimate their chances. So I think Lasker's psychology here, pretend to be weak and he may grow arrogant. That's definitely psychologic, psychological, but also in, in openings as, as well. Pretending to be weak so that they grow arrogant, like push too many pawns in chess. If you push too many pawns, you're creating loads of weaknesses. Um, <clears throat> Brian V writes, don't uh, uh, talk your opponent. Sorry, I don't understand that, Brian. Sorry. <laughs> I, I have no idea what you're saying there, Brian. Tell me what you want to say there. <laughs> Sorry. Um, point 22. If he's taking his ease, give him no rest. So when the opponent's resting, give him no rest. If his, opponent, if his forces united, separate them. I suppose that's spreading disharmony. Doesn't that relate to what we've said earlier about disharmony? If the opponents united, separate them. You don't want your opponent's pieces working too well together. Attack him where he's unprepared. Appear where you are not expected. I think that's a bit difficult, because if you've got an advantage on the queen's side... Then you're going to strike a blow on the queen side. You might have passed pawns on the queen side. So I think that's almost a contradiction. How can you appear where you're not expected? But the thing is about that. Sometimes in 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 the king's engine, you can have an attack raging on the queen side, but then infiltrate on the seventh rank to get to the opponent's king. So it's almost unexpected that you you make a transition from the queen side to the king's side. Um, all right, you've you've said exactly the same thing as me just there. Uh, Brian V. Fly, flying your queen from the A file to the H file, rook lifts, etc. You're right, so the rooks have that great versatility to appear where they're not expected. Qu quite right, yes. Tw 24. Um, Brian V writes, pawn preparation uh, to Fincetto. Fisher did this, but not didn't Fincetto. Right. And then the bishop didn't Fincetto, it just moved somewhere else, covering key squares unexpectedly. Like he did this bishop e2 instead of fianchettoing because he'd played g3. But bishop on e2 was like attacking b5 or something. Uh, so 24. These military devices leading to victory must not be divulged beforehand. 
Well, I, I guess it's like in chess, you don't want to speak your opponent's thoughts. Sorry, you don't want to speak your thoughts to the opponent. It's all going to be in secret. Um, otherwise, the opponent will anticipate everything. So, um, point 25 is the last point here. So, now the general who wins a battle makes many calculations in his temple and the battle is fought. The general who loses a battle makes few calculations beforehand. I'm slightly uncomfortable with this calculation business. I associate calculation with Kotov. I like the idea of intuition, which is, can be seen as you know very long-term calculation. If like you've got two connected passports, you might not calculate that all the way. You just know, hang on, evaluation comes in. You say, look, I've got two past pawns in that variation. So you've done a little bit of if then, but then you say, but two past pawns. So I think calculation mixed with evaluation myself. This sounds a bit too Kotovian, point 25. Thus do many calculations lead to victory, and few calculations lead to defeat. I will argue in chess, too many calculations lead to mental exhaustion and defeat. <laughs> too few calculations can lead to a tactical disaster, but generally, I, I, I think you mix you know, a, a calculation with evaluation, personally. Um, so you don't want to over calculate, you just get really tired. And then you haven't got just that battle, you've got the battle after the next game, the next game, the next game. Um, Brian V writes, I remember one video, uh, I was thinking Anand and Kramnik. Anand kept on playing e4, and then on game 7 he played the Queen's pawn opening. Kramnik stared at him then bored wondering what to do yeah it was took ages didn't he it was a total shock there's there's a very funny uh youtube video about that where kramnik's in total shock then doesn't he play the sicilian defense after much much consideration i think he plays <laughs> the sicilian defense but it was such a shock it makes for a very funny um youtube video as if as if um kramnik has never seen one e4 before but of course he's working for all the different variations he might anticipate for man end um so how how much more no calculation at all it, it is attention at this point i can foresee who is likely to win or lose i i don't know about you guys i think that's too much emphasis on calculation uh, because as human beings chess is just too vast to calculate anyway it's only computers that can improve by calculating i think we have very limited calculation ability actually i think we've got to use our evaluation skills uh, what, what do you guys think about that? But that those these points seem of great relevance in this section one laying plans actually. Do you, do you guys think uh, that many of these points echo with chess? Um, <clears throat> although although here it, start, it started to be irrelevant here or, or seemingly too abstract for us to to be able to interpret. Um, but now like comparing. Uh, like two players um i don't know but here it started to be extremely irrelevant i think um from point um 16 bang 17 bang i thought these points were very relevant myself i don't know about you guys but these from point 16 to 25 i don't know if these have been interpreted accurately from the ancient Chinese manuscript, but these seem very, very relevant and pertinent to chess. Uh, what do you guys think? Um, so, like changing your plan depending on the position, uh, you know, trying to hide your threats, veil your threats, you know, layers of sophistication in your play, not just going for a fool's mate. Um, you know, ha you know, like having contradictions, apparent contradictions. But I think we, we know in hypermodern theory that they're trying to control the centre, not necessarily occupy the centre. And it's no real contradiction, because the whole point of occupation was actually control anyway. So it's not really a contradiction. But um, if you seem not to be you know, occupying the centre, you can later blow it up anyway. Uh, so there's things like that. Um, holding out bait to entice the enemy. Feign the same all... all feign disorder and crush him so it's like you know sacrificing you know decoys deflections i think the deflection is one of the most common uh tactic uh, motifs deflection um <clears throat> so if the opponent's solid be prepared for him i think is that like maneuvering you could just maneuver a few bits back just waiting for weaknesses so you're being prepared you don't have to make concessions just the if the opponent is has a very solid position i think you just need to stay prepared 
So that's a very interesting. And if, if they're a superior strength, invade them. I think where the opponent's playing on the on, on parts of the board where they're stronger, you don't want to play on those parts of the board. Uh, and this, this is Lascarian psychology, I think, this point here. Okay, so attack where it's unprepared, appear where you're not expected. And this stuff about calculation, I'm not sure I completely agree with in, in, in chess terms. Um, so I hope you found uh, this chapter one, um, section one, interesting. I'm not sure, maybe we should take a break, um, but I'm, I'm gonna save this now. So interpretation of the art and war, uh, section one.